All right. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, thanks, Chris, uh, Dean of the Library. Good evening. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This is going to be a super awesome event. My name is John Jackson. I am the head of outreach for the library, and I'm going to get out of your way as soon as possible. Um, but first, just a couple administrative things. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Dean of the Library, Chris Brancolini, thank you for coming out and welcome to our March edition of Faculty Pub Night with Evelyn McDonald. Um, a few things. For the students who are in the room, um, if you need credit for attending tonight's event, come see me afterwards and we'll swipe you in. Um, or we can just take down your name, whatever you prefer. Uh, on your seats, you have some feedback forms. So at the end of the night, thank you, Chris, for modeling those. At the end of the evening, if you could place those in that uh, clear box over there, let us know what you thought of the event. And if you give us your email, then you could be entered into a $100 uh, Amazon gift card raffle. And then let me see uh, one other thing. Oh, yes. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Faculty Pub Night, this is an opportunity for us to exhibit and celebrate the creative and scholarly works of our faculty here at LMU. Uh, we select eight speakers every year, one per month during the fall and spring semester, and the call for the 2019-2020 series is currently open. So if you know of any colleagues or faculty members who have recently published something, uh, please let me know and I'll send you the CFP. So, as I promised, I'm gonna get out of the way. Um, thank you so much to KXLU for being here, for presenting. Thank you, Floor, for the set uh, that we had at the beginning. We're going to have one more set. Yes. We're going to have one more set uh, at the end of tonight's event. So please stick around, help us finish off the food and the alcohol, um, and enjoy uh, one more set from our KXLU DJs. Um, so I'm going to hand it over now to Melissa McAllister, who has a show, you may know it, it's called She Rocks, it's on KXLU, Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Melissa McAllister, where are you at? There you are, welcome Melissa, who's going to help us kick things off. very excited about drinking in this library right now. <laughs> uh, my name is Melissa McAllister. Um, I host She Rocks here uh, at KXLU. Um, it is an hour of music made by uh, those who identify as female in a variety of genres. Um, everything from rock to um, soul, folk, anything in between, we try to play it. And I'm very excited to be here tonight. This is actually the second time uh, LMU has got me to come to one of these and talk about <laughs> rock and roll in the library, which is great. <laughs> um, and uh, to the students, I'm really jealous that you're getting credit to talk about feminist pioneers, because that's <laughs> all I wanted to do when I was here. <laughs> um, so, uh, Evelyn McDonald. Last time we were here, we were talking about Queen the Noise. If you haven't read that book, you should already have it. Go home, get it on Amazon right now. Um, but now we are talking about uh, women who rock, uh, Beyonce uh, to Bessie Smith, girl groups to Riot Girl. Took me a while to like get that mouthful, but right. Um, I am so excited that not only did she decide to put these stories out there, that more importantly, she chose to do it in a method where she asked other women to tell the stories. Because not only is it important for us to make sure that we're telling the history of music the right way with women in it, but it's important for women to tell that story. To make sure that it's not packaged up in a cute little side note. Because sometimes the stories are messy, sometimes they're sad, sometimes they go places that you don't expect them. but we have to tell them the right way and we have to be a part of it or we're not telling the story. So I'm excited that she did it and I'm excited that she had a variety of people to help her from artists to uh, journalists to DJs all running the gamut. And um, I just, I love that she's not afraid to tackle such a big project and she does it with such enthusiasm and uh, I'm excited for the, her to lead this panel right now. And um, thank you. Hi. Can everybody hear me? I'm going to leave it in there. 
Hi everybody, thank you all for coming um, and uh, not being afraid of the atmospheric river <laughs> all of us to dive into yet again. Um, so it's really great to see a variety of faces um, here, my students, to my colleagues, um, to uh, some Peter in the house, uh, <laughs> um, as well as to my esteemed colleagues and contributors to the book, who I will um, introduce you to shortly. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about the book, which is here. And by the way, McAllister, this is your copy of the book. Where did you go? Um, oh, there you are. So this is for you, and we will all sign it for you. Um, I forgot to give this to her before, so don't let me forget again. Um, so this is the book, Women Who Rock, Best of Beyonce, Girl Groups to Riot Girl. Um, this is a, oh, here, I'll show it to you on the slide, uh, show. These are, so the book, not only is it all uh, written by women, um, all the contributors are women or, or female identified, all the subjects are women or female identified, um, it's also all the artwork, it's original artwork um, that is also by women. Um, so that's the inside uh, cover underneath. Under the, if you don't like the pink, <laughs> I know that's controversial. Um, if you don't like the pink, you can take it off. It's pink with a Y, okay, as Janelle Monae says, right? Um, definitely, I was so happy when she did that. Oops, uh, sorry. Um, this is what's underneath, which is a collage of some of the original artwork that's inside. Um, so, uh, we have a quiz uh, if you guys can identify who can identify. I, we were going to do that online and never did. Who can identify all the, all the people here? I'll ask like one. Okay. Uh, who's this? Can anybody see? Very good. 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 Holly Starman, whatever it is. <laughs> um, okay, and there's there is Janelle Monae. <laughs> um, so uh, and one of the points with the book was to um, not only write about the artists that you might expect us to write about, like Bessie Smith, um, who begins the book, the dawn of recorded music, essentially, um, to you know Beyonce, uh, but also maybe to um, introduce some people who aren't as well known um, and because part of the idea of a feminist history is that there's of course the voices that don't get appreciated in their lifetimes or, and maybe even afterwards um, for all the reasons that uh, we, we know um, and that we've all been hearing a lot about lately in terms of um, the behavior of the music industry and uh, just the behavior of culture in general. So people like maybe Holly Starring that you apparently didn't know, uh, who was the singer of the great uh, English punk band, um, X-Ray Specs, just incredible, incredible woman by cancer a few years ago. Um, so uh, I'm going to read a little bit, bit <coughs> from the book, and then I'm going to ask each of the, I'll introduce each of the contributors and ask them to share um, one of their essays with you. Um, and then we're going to have a little conversation. Um, I'm going to ask them some questions, um, fill you in on some other stuff that's been going on around the book. It's kind of exciting. Um, and then uh, we'll have some time for your questions at the end as well. So uh, especially my journalism students should be prepared with your questions. Um, uh, so I'm just going to read a little bit from the intro that explains the idea of the book. All the people in this book are rhythm movers. The musicians, the writers, the illustrators, they have not merely tried to fit into the grooves of popular music or scholarship or art, but have jumped the beat. They are musicians who inspire and compel us by carving out sonic possibilities, by kicking down the doors through which their followers charge. They are pioneers more than settlers, explorers, but not necessarily popularizers, mothers of invention. They are sister Rosetta Tharp, pulling the gospel out of a guitar. Selena embodying the multiple cadences of border culture. Bjork dancing beside you in a virtual reality video, then stepping inside you, or are you stepping inside her? Beyonce 
commanding World Stop in a video alongside her bestie at the time, Nicki Minaj, then chuckling, carry on. Women who bend, break, and create code tend to be dismissed as weirdos, freaks, divas, bitches. This book honors them as heroes, leaders, geniuses, and in Miami rapper Trina's phrase, the baddest bitches, <laughs> as women who rock. Um, so that's the uh, sort of idea of the book. There's over 100 essays, um, almost 40 contributors, ranging from the Electro Clash goddess uh, Peaches um, to uh, Salamisha Tillett, the scholar and uh, occasional contributor to the New York Times. Um, they're DJs, they're uh, journalists, they're poets, um, and some of them are with us here tonight. <laughs> so without further ado, um, I will introduce our first panelist who has come to us all the way from East Hurley, New York. Um, West so, West Hurley, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, East West, sorry. Uh, she has written about electronica, bluegrass, post-war design patents, pigeon racing, wedding veils, and cigarette packaging um, for places including the New York Times, the Village Boys, Marie Claire, Chemical Imbalance magazine when it was around, Glimmer Train, uh, Tinker Street. Um, she's a contributing editor for the website The Weaklings. Um, and also uh, writes uh, fiction books as well, and short stories, um, including a novel that she is working on. It's not really seen out. Um, she also uh, is a musician. She recently sang with the Outlaw Opera uh, in the Woodstock area where she resides. Um, and she was in the bands uh, The Rings and uh, Iron Goddess of Mercy. <laughs> um, so, Yana Martin wrote four entries actually in Women Who Rock, um, and she's going to tell us about Luna. It, it's so great to be here, and thank you, Evelyn. And it's great to meet my colleagues in page as well as in reality. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Welcome. Okay. So um, back when I played a lot of um, punk rock, um, the drummer in a band I had called Crotch City, it was made of seven women. It was Tucson, and it was the early 90s, so, you know, Crotch City women. <laughs> and um, so she wanted to cover a Joni Mitchell song. And... Um, we couldn't agree on the song to cover, and then we agreed on the song to cover, but we couldn't cover it. And the fact that we couldn't cover it was sort of this wonderful revelation, like, wow, she's really good, you know, which we all knew. But um, it made me think about her a little differently. It made me think about her as a really major, major writer. And too often, right, she's been typed as you know, a lady of the canyon, right? <laughs> and uh, the long skirt and all that stuff. And so when Evelyn asked, you know, well, who do you want to write about? I came up with some obvious choices. And I was like, I want to write about Joni Mitchell, too. You know, what can I do with a thousand words that will do credit to this amazing, amazing composer? So um, I can't read the whole thing. And... Um, a thousand words kind of is an argument, right? If it, I don't know how many of you are writers in here. How many of you are writers in here? Okay, then you know. Then we're all set. Um, you know, you, you take a thousand words, you need to put it together. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it has to hold together like a truss roof. Otherwise, you know, the bottom falls out. So read the rest of it on your own. <laughs> and read everybody else's. So I'm just going to read the beginning of this. Joni Mitchell is often described as some kind of brilliant contradiction, a winsome folky who invented an incredibly complex guitar tuning, a confirmed dulcimer and soprano folk artist who composes cerebral jazz, the famed author of the seminal song about Woodstock, circa 1969, who wasn't there. Mitchell is all of those things and more. She's a confirmed 
musical genius who would prefer other people to stay confused rather than trap her in their oversimplifications. She's beat a few hasty and angry retreats from the music industry, yet her music is instantly recognizable, right? And a vital part of pop music's canonical songbook. And she has always insisted that she's really just a painter whose career was, as she famously said, derailed by circumstance. She had a radio-friendly voice that embodied a generation, then chafed against the pop harness and headed towards more experimental horizons. She came at her music from an artist's point of view. Her origin story had a kind of 60s mythos, the stubborn child of no-nonsense parents in Saskatoon, Canada. She had early talent for piano, but refused to play for 10 years after a teacher criticized her for playing by ear. <laughs> I love this fact. <laughs> she began singing and performing when she was stricken by polio and confined to a hospital. Her trademark stubbornness drove her to write her own songs when Canada's folk clubs wouldn't book her singing covers. She left the Toronto folk scene for the U.S. and became a bona fide hit maker. When Judy Collins recorded Mitchell's Both Sides Now, it rocketed to number eight on the U.S. charts in two months, but the song was immediately galvanized into a trope that Mitchell, as well as Collins and others, would fight the rest of their careers, the open-eyed, pretty girlfriend in a miniskirt, philosophizing about the illusion of love, yet ever ready to be swept off her feet again. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much. Well, my tweet today. I was so happy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I tweeted, I quoted from the essay that you're about to hear. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Very good week on social media. Um, the book had a good week. So um, our next contestant, <laughs> our next contributor, um, hosts KXLU's public affairs show Sunday nights at 7 p.m. So make sure to tune in to that. Um, she uh, is a, a, also a DJ, um, as well as a podcast producer, based here in Los Angeles. Just got her own apartment, <laughs> little house, uh, um, and uh, she works uh, for Crooked Media. Um, and she's also produced pieces for MTV News, Marketplace, and PR affiliate stations. Um, she is co-founder of the feminist music and arts collective Honey Power. Um, and she also creates audio art installations using voicemails left anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> so you might want to ask her about that later. <laughs> um, she was named Best Radio DJ in Los Angeles by LA Weekly in 2014, um, which is pretty amazing. And um, I guess at that point, you were, were you still an LMU student? Or, or yeah. You just, you're, so class of 2014. Um, and uh, she's been in LA Record and on BBC Radio 6. So please welcome Mukta Moha. Um, I didn't print mine out, so I'm going to yeah. really find it. Um, but yeah, as, as Lynn mentioned, I've had a radio show on KXLU for a long time. I served out as a student here, and um, I'm just excited to be back. I spent many nights working really late up here in this library. Um, 
And I, well, first off, I want to say that I'm so excited about this book. Um, I think it's amazing that one that it exists, that we, that Evelyn was able to assemble such an amazing group of writers from all over with a, with a wide range of experience who truly, like, genuinely care about their subjects and um, are able to con uh, to convey their stories. Um, because as uh, McAllister mentioned earlier, like, sometimes these stories are messy and they are complicated and it's not as clean cut as you want them to be. And I found that to be the case with Shaka Khan. Um, like, she... Her music seems really fun and upbeat often. Um, like I, when I first started to write about her, um, Evelyn sent me a list of a bunch of musicians, and I was drawn to Shaka Khan because I remembered seeing like the something tell me tell me something good video where you see her dancing and it's so fun. But then if you look into her personal life and her backstory, like she has had a lot of heartbreak, a lot of uh, trauma and trouble, and um, up until recently. Um, going into rehab, having just a bunch of different issues, and so I was I was really struck by the perseverance that she had, and her sense of self, and like such a strong sense of identity and self, and to be able to continue um, to push through and make really gorgeous music, that I think is it's incredible. Like her range of voice is amazing. <laughs> um, but let me find this. I don't remember the page that it's on. Cool. So I'll just read like a little piece of this. Shaka Khan. In the Yoruba tradition, it is believed that people live out the meanings of their names. Names are taken so seriously that they're treated almost as spirits who are looking for a physical embodiment to live out their purpose. So in 1967, when an African Baba in, an all, in all white renamed Yvette Maria Yvette Marie Stevens to Shaka Adune Adufe Yomoha Hodari Karifi. He was breathing a new destiny into her being. Yvette was a teenage girl from an artistic yet broken home on the south side of Chicago. But Shaka was a woman of fire. That's what her name meant. A few years later, she went on to take her husband's, first, her husband's last name, completing the identity of the icon we know as Shaka Khan. We may associate Khan with her fire-like qualities of energy and passion, but what's harder to see are the ashes underneath the flame. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then, um, I mean, I went on to talk through some of those challenges that she had, like her given name. So while soul, while soul music of the 1960s was the voice of the civil rights movement, the early 70s gave birth to a fusion of jazz, R&B, soul, and Afro-Cuban rhythms that came to create together to create a danceable rhythmic style called funk. It was the sound of black power, celebration, and sensual indulgence. And at the center of it all was her bell bottoms and big hair was Shaka Khan, the queen of funk. Khan's given name, Woman of Fire, comes with two sides, the glistening energy that pops and sparks and the darker underside that burns what lies underneath. As glamorous as her life may seem, <coughs> Khan struggled throughout. Her parents were both alcoholics and her father was addicted to heroin. They separated when she was 12 years old and Khan ran away from home at 16. I went on to talk more about her life, but also her involvement with Rufus and how that sparked her own uh, career as, her solo career as Shaka Khan, who we know today. Um, but yeah, so I ended off and this with Shaka Khan's vocal range and songwriting talent made her one of the most iconic women in the music industry. She's pushed through her pain to make music that we can all dance to and belt out without, with either heartache or joy. So when the Yoruba priest renamed Yvette to Shaka, he probably saw sparks waiting to live out its full potential. With his hands rubbed together, he may have blown a little heat on the ember, but it, was all, but it has always been Khan's energy coming alive.
Um, so um, the, our next contributor um, is uh, also a, a colleague from um, the world of the academy <laughs> of the universities. Um, Shauna L. Redman is um, the author of Anthem, Social Movements, and the Sound of Solidarity in the African Diaspora, which was published by NYU Press and also in 2014, and which is for sale tonight. So um, she will be signing copies of that, as well as we will all be signing copies of Women Who Rock after this. Um, and she's also working on a book called Everything Man, The Form and Function of Paul Robeson. Her work has appeared in numerous media and literary outlets, including NPR, The Huffington Post, The Feminist Wire, and Brick. And she teaches, just up the road a little bit, in the Herb Alpert School of Music at UCLA. Um, she wrote two entries for Women Who Rock, and she's going to talk about that. Thanks, Sean. to thank Evelyn for doing the work of putting this collection together. I have edited a book before and it was horrible. <laughs> I will never do it again, hopefully. I always say yes to things I, I say I'll never do again. Um, oh, wait, but can, can we go back to your website? Yeah. And just to get the uh, lock. And another person who renamed herself, right? Similar to the story of Shaka Khan. Um, and I'm old enough to remember Queen Latifah as an MC. Some of you may not know her as an MC. <laughs> I chose to mostly focus on this part of her career because that is the part most compelling to me. Um, but feel free to add to the story in your own ways. Um, but I'm also someone, as my first book suggests, who is interested in music as a political strategy. And I think that Latifah was really strong and prominent and foundational in thinking about feminist anthemic production, thinking about women's music as setting the groundwork for how women expected to be treated in popular culture. And so I wanted to talk about the work that she did early in her career when she was an MC before she became everything else. And so this is what I wrote. In the pantheon of feminist provocations, the question, who you calling a bitch, ranks high. <laughs> Confrontational rather than diplomatic, it identifies a gross injury and refuses it, casting scorn back from whence it came. It's raucous and resonant, continuing to echo in everyday conversation as well as spectacular protest, highlighting its incendiary didacticism. This famed one-liner from the shape-shifting MC Queen Latifah from her 1993 anthem track UNITY remains a benchmark for the entertainer who, at various moments in her career, used hip-hop to confront popular rap caricatures of black women as bitches and hoes. This critical posturing beckoned me to her tribe like a teacher to a student. It was why I listened then and why I continue to listen almost 30 years later. So she was born in 1970 in New Jersey, and she came quickly into a certain type of political aesthetics. She began her career very much picking up on, as this image suggests, a more Afrocentric posturing, both in the way that she presented herself physically, but also in the types of ideas that she was putting on wax. She was part of the um, Pan-African organization of MCs called Native Tongues, which included De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, as well as the UK MC Moni Love. And she used that as inspiration for many of her early solo albums. Marked on its cover with the colors of Marcus Garvey's black nationalist flag of red, black, and green, and the silhouette of Africa, her first solo album, All Hail the Queen from 1990, is in some ways indicative of its time. It becomes a smorgasbord of different diasporic sounds from house to reggae to what is more recognizable as US hip hop. And she continues to have various styles represented on a number of her albums. The album that most strikes me was her third album, her third studio album that exploded with confidence called Black Rain 
from 1993. Dedicated to her brother, who died in a motorcycle accident, Rain introduces the Latifa from the Garden State. Gone are the African-inspired accessories. Now wearing knit hats and baseball caps, jerseys and overalls, down coats and oversized leather jackets, she reflects the hybrid feminine-masculine aesthetic in contemporary R&B of the period, as well as hip-hop, and represents for the curvy women who didn't bear their midriff like Aliyah, but nonetheless found and flaunted their sexuality in baggy jeans. She was our thick chick idol who proved that sexuality is to be enjoyed, not abused or taken advantage of. And multiple tracks on that album, which celebrated its 25th anniversary last year to crickets, I'm sad to say, um, including the standout UNITY, announced that women won't settle for anything less than respect. It goes on to talk a little bit about her uh, career in television and film and to speculate on why we don't know her as an MC anymore. Latifah's ascent to a regular television presence in the late 1990s signaled the end of an era in which she was known first as a hip hop artist. In 1998, she released her final Motown album, Order in the Court, which was also her first to warrant a parental advisory. Her most recent three albums highlight her as a vocalist, and only on the last does she reinvent her skills as an MC, and even there sparingly. In the wake of a highly decorated acting and producing career in television and film, as well as limited record of longevity for female MCs in popular music, she may have abandoned her lyricism for more lucrative projects with crossover appeal. That would be understandable, but I hold out hope for a return to the source, a reintroduction of the badass anti pinup cover girl who slays 16 bars at the age of 48, 58, and beyond. So our final reader tonight, um, Shana talked about how music could be an act of political production. I think that um, Alison Wolf has uh, really embodied that throughout her career, um, both as a as a singer, um, originally with the band Bratmobile, um, but then through all sorts of different bands, Moms and um, Sex Stains, and then X Stains. <laughs> um, uh, Double Scorpio, uh, who knows what project she's going to have next. Um, <laughs> she may not tell us. Um, but then also as uh, one of the founders of the Riot Girl movement um, out of Olympia in the early 90s. Um, Alice was there, um, editing, co-founding the punk feminist fanzine Girl Germs, um, so doing some early writing. Um, and she also uh, initiated the music festival Lady Fest, uh, which was merged post Riot Girl again in Olympia. Um, so she's really been doing that work of activism um, combined with making music and inspiring us all. Um, she lives in Los Angeles now, um, and uh, she got her master's in arts journalism from the USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. As did a pie. <laughs> Thanks, <dear. laughs> um, and she's currently work working on an oral history of the Riot Girl movement um, and audio archive for it. She's also been doing the incredible I Am The Band podcast um, that was on title and I'm sure is going to be coming to our airwaves soon in another form. <laughs> Lots of hints of things to come. Uh, please welcome Alison Wolf. <laughs> Was Fair, who I interviewed and wrote about. Um, I knew her a bit in the early 90s and stuff, and I had these uh, tapes of this band she did called Girly Sound that I just carried around with me everywhere. Um, a mutual friend of ours gave it to me, and uh, I really cherished it. Um, 
And then I was blown away when just like a year or two later, she was like huge on the college radio chart. So I'm like, I remember that tape I carried in my pocket. <laughs> I remember one. Anyway, so it was very exciting to revisit um, all this stuff with her. Um, okay, I'll try to read a little, and I don't know, hopefully I don't read too much. Um, in early 90s, post Reagan with the side of Bush America, <laughs> times were changing. Identity politics flourished and the onslaught of grunge kicked off the mainstreamization of alternative culture. As Nirvana and punk broke, riot girls and gender queers in indie music were building their arsenal in response to musical sexism and heterosexism, disguised in long hair and flannel. All right, I just wanted to set the stage for the times. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, um, her deadpan, or oh, then I'm talking about Liz Fair. Um, so I guess I I got these tapes, and it was uh, I think during the Gulf War when she the first one when she first started kind of making these tapes, and there was like there were like thirty songs or something, and some of them were about the war, which I think a lot of people never really thought of her as that political, but she was politicized early on. Um, but a lot of her stuff was um, what I was calling it's like this. I thought a deadpan delivery of these kind of really honest, um, I don't know, kind of like almost gender wars in personal <laughs> life and in the bedroom and beyond. Um, double standards, really. And I thought she was so brilliant in the way that she wrote about it and sung about it. And I, and I just love that deadpan delivery, too. It's like, I know what's going on. Here's what's going on. <laughs> um, and also, I think she was very honest and almost shocking sometimes. It was sexually explicit. She'd uh, kind of incriminate herself as well in a lot of the songs. So, okay, so yeah, so when uh, Fair signed to Matador and unleashed her 1993 debut album, Exile and Guyville, upon the male-dominated alternative music scene, challenging the reign of the debaucherous male rap god and inserting herself on his throne, <laughs> Fair's Girl Next Door image enabled her to slip in under the college radio radar and skewer mainstream stereotypes of womanhood of womanhood with her sexually explicit yet feminist lyrics. The controversial indie rock darling seemed to ruffle feathers all over the place. Was she a good girl or a bad girl? She was neither marketable enough nor punk enough, and she didn't seem to really care. <laughs> and she, she still doesn't. Um, so I, I talk a little bit about how she was adopted and how I think she kind of um, references that um, as a part of her life that kind of keeps her from fully identifying with any one thing. Um, she, when she was in high school, she didn't graduate on time because she refused to take a home ec class <laughs> that was required, <laughs> strangely enough. Um, so she had a little uh, protest going on in high school. And then she went on to um, Oberlin College and she was in an art history class. So she was an art major, and that was really what she wanted to do. And um, she said that this uh, kind of, these ideas that kind of became the driving force of her life happened, she had this epiphany in an art class when she had this great art history book that they had to read and maybe have a big final exam on or something. And she was flipping through it and going through it and going through it and going through it. and she could hardly find any women artists at all in the whole book, and it was massive. And um, it was supposed to be a comprehensive art history book, and she was outraged. And here's a quote from her. She said, I saw our invisibility. It wasn't that women didn't make art. They weren't allowed, encouraged, considered, or paid to. I wanted us to be seen and for our lives to count. And then... I think that's kind of when she started really thinking about how she could do that. Um, but she also had been making these four track tapes in bedrooms and stuff like that um, when she would go home a lot um, to Chicago, where she's from. And uh, I think she you know, eventually realized that that was kind of how she was going to do it. Um, Fair would return to Chicago, and when she did, she'd immerse herself in the Wicker Park music scene where she became acutely aware of the psychic manspread of Guyville. Fair asserts that men were always teaching her about what good music was. <laughs> they tried to my fair lady me. 
<laughs> it's an interesting insult, really, the idea that men are the ones who know and women should listen and learn. And I think that really kind of drove her, like all the topics and stuff, in Exile and Guyville, which you know was her big, her big thing. Um, full of bravado and brash, sexually candid tales, Exile and Guyville catapulted Fair into the alternative rock spotlight she'd asked for, but didn't quite know how to navigate. Male rock gods and rock, uh, rock and roll singers have forever talked about sex graphically and gotten it on the radio. As a woman, I wanted to take that back, says Fair. And the album was, a, I guess, a partially response to Rolling Stone's Exile on Main Street. Um, I don't really think so. I don't know. I didn't feel that way to me. But, but I also never listened to the Stones. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I never was quite interested, especially that one. Okay. Um, she was intentional with how she represented herself, but couldn't control the way it was received. Oh my God, I was the blowjob queen. Reflects Flair on the media's obsession with only the sexual aspects of her work. Though she position, positioned herself as the subject, not the object of her music, Fair says, the complexity that I was displaying in a kind of novella turned into endless talk about two or three lines from one song. Mm. Surprised by the sexist backlash Fair incurred, drummer Brad Wood, her drummer, uh, remembers a particularly inappropriate question asked of Fair's backing bandmates at a UK gig. Even Liam Gallagher from Oasis showed his caveman nature by asking us if Liz paid us in blowjobs. Yeah. So that was an interesting interview, getting that one. Um, so yeah, that happened to her a lot. Um, and then I go on to just kind of talk about um, sort of like her kind of difficulties with how to kind of navigate all that, but also she went on to do other albums, as some of you may know, but it seemed like they kind of decreased in popularity as it went along. Um, but it's kind of cool. She's just a, it's really good natured about everything. It's just kind of I love every moment of all of it, um, really. Except for I think she was kind of hard during the Guy Hill years. Um, and then she had, uh, I think in 2003, she had a self-titled uh, album that people seemed to really rage against. Um, the Indian music world came crashing down on Fair for selling out in a scene she never fully belonged to or identified with. And she says, I got so much shit for making a pop record, says Fair, of the album which produced Why Can't I, which was her biggest hit to date, actually. <laughs> as much as everyone hated it and hated on me, at least I got to fully inhabit that experience. In there. I, I think it's cool, you know. Anyways, it was really great to interview her. And, and since then, she re-released Exile and Guyville and did the Soul box set and has been playing music. And I haven't gotten to go to any concerts. But anyway, at the time I wrote this, I had no idea she was making this comeback. Well, kind of my little. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Is this well? <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. Now can you hear me? Hello. Okay. Yes. Ooh. Wow. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I will have. A, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions of my panelists, <laughs> um, and then we'll take some questions from you as well, and then we will sign some books and have some drinks and um, here enjoy some more KXL UT. So Where is? stay tuned. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me just ask, um, we talked about, uh, you know, political act of, of making music. Um, do you, do you think of it that way, Allison or Yana, did you, and um, does, does, does it have to be, like, what, what is the role of politics um, in making music or in, in? Well, yeah, I think for me it was, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I played clarinet and bass clarinet like in middle school and high school, but I never felt like a real musician. <laughs> but I think that was kind of the whole point. I came from Olympia, Washington, and there was kind of a history of this non-professionalism, anti-professionalism, and the idea that anyone and everyone could just pick up whatever and make some noise and still have something that was interesting, you had something to say, and, or it was interesting in some way. Um, so I'm lucky to have come from there, from a very supportive community. Um, but 
it took something like that to actually make me feel like I could be in a band and do something like that. But I think also the impetus was, oh my God, this grunge stuff is so annoying, um, which was huge in the Northwest um, for a long time before it even broke. But it, I love the music and the bands in a way, but I just, it was so sexist and there's such shock value sexism going on and just with long hair, flannel. Um, and it just, I don't know, and, and we would get injured at the shows. They were still pretty violent. And um, I just felt like these guys were kind of idiots and didn't really have anything to say. And I thought, you know what? The, all the women I know in punk have a lot of cool things to say. So I, I'm not saying I had cool things to say, <laughs> but I just felt like, well, anything's got to be better than this, lyrically at least. Um, so, yeah. so I just kind of started doing that, but yeah, I don't think I would be making music if it didn't have some sort of, something that felt like it was challenging mainstream values in some way, or, and, but I, my take is usually the personal is political kind of thing. Like, we're the kid sisters to Bikini Kill. <laughs> They're more direct, but I was a little bit more like, personal is political with a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you write about this in, in Anthem, with, you know, how do you feel these things intersect? Yeah, I mean, it's very much the element that Allison just mentioned, the personal is political. I mean, politics covers a broad spectrum, right? It's not just the protests in the streets. It's also the ways in which, you know, people speaking of their bedroom situations on wax actually makes a difference for people protests who are, in the sheets. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, people who are identifying as queer or non-binary or all of these things that actually begin to change people's sensibilities. That's politics. So I just want to be clear that it's this whole spectrum of approaches, of challenges that are really significant and accumulate to revolution. Did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I found that lately especially I've been really drawn to music that has been made in different countries. Um, I've listened to a lot of international stuff. Um, often that's been made during civil wars or during time of turmoil. And I find that even here in the United States, um, if it doesn't have to be during wartime, but I feel like um, I'm drawn to a lot of music that comes from rebellion. And I think often the coolest music <laughs> and what ends up making it into like, the next cycle of whatever breaks through the mainstream um, often comes from challenging the mainstream and whatever that looks like. So whether that's challenging uh, materialism, whether that's challenging whoever's in power at the moment, whether that's challenging um, political decisions that are being made, or if it's on a smaller scale, just our presence here is political because we're operating in a space that we're not supposed to be in. Um, like that in itself to me is fascinating. So I think that, yeah, I think that just there are so many ties between music and power. I think that music in itself often is a response to these power dynamics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the personal, the, uh, I think the musical is always, it's, it's always political. It's, it just is. Because I think, um, I mean, as a musician, um, I remember, you know, I played guitar and I played bass and um, I even way, way, way back at a, you know, at an arts camp, as a music, at a music camp that was really celebrated for, you know, showing kids how to play and all sorts of different instruments and you get to be in shows and all of this and I was playing in a band and they wouldn't let me take a guitar solo. And I was like, I'm 16, you're ruining me. You know? <laughs> but I think on a, on a very uh, essential level, especially um, throughout looking through this book and everybody who contributed to it, the illustrators and the writers, it's all an effort to be heard. Who controls who gets to be heard, right? Music is all about, listen to me, I have something to say. And the idea that there's a body of judges that will say whether or not you can be heard, that was something that I experienced in those, that sort of grunge thing, it was amazing. Because we don't think about a band like Nirvana as being a bunch of 
flannel shirted assholes. <laughs> forgive me, forgive me, okay? <laughs> but I played in um, bands in Tucson, and sometimes we'd go on these mini tours with bands like the Melvins, you know, slow core, a lot of, it was really fun, but we constantly had to fight to not be treated like a novelty act, you know. We were told, why don't you wear skirts? Why don't you look cuter? Those vintage clothes are really adorable, but maybe you want to be a little more attractive looking, you know. And so when you look at some of the music that came out of that time, there's this rage, really. You know, yeah, you can wear pigtails, but you're outraged all the time. And it's really about who's going to let you tell your story? Who's going to listen? And so I think always making an expression of what you have in your head and what you want to do is it's got to be a political act because you're fighting for air most of us are fighting for air and we have to take it i, I mean i also think that not saying anything and not um, protesting sure. is a political stance too i mean if, if you are privileged enough to accept the status quo and to be happy with it, then you've, you've made your, your stance of, of accommodation, essentially, mm -hmm. to um, a system that, uh, for many people, is, is um, not so, uh, does not treat so well. So do, how do people, I mean, this book covers almost 100 years, and um, there's a lot of, you know, stories of victory and of, of triumph in it, but there's also a lot of stories that are brought with tragedy, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's a sort of continuing theme of um, suffering and overcoming difficulties uh, to get your music heard. How do, how do you think things are today? Um, and um, how, how can we help the next generation not have to go through um, some of these things? Who wants the mic? <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, sorry, to go back. So, yeah, what is like this, uh, the situation yeah, now? Yeah, yeah. How do you, I mean. Well, I think it's going to your point about there's a lot of suffering in it. I think that's just part of being human. And I feel like what this book does so well is it captures the human experience that these women had, it doesn't just sexualize them, doesn't just um, like create one dimensional characters. It's textured because humans are textured and we all go through ups and downs in our lives. Um, in terms of like that fight to get airtime, I think that I personally feel like things are changing. Mm -hmm. And like looking at the pressure that has been put on the gatekeepers, so people who book music festivals, people who are booking at venues, um, people who, like that to me, I've seen a lot of changes on really big scales. Like if you, I remember when I was a student even here at KXLU, we went through festival lineups and we looked at uh, all of the male artists and all of the female artists. And if you removed all the men on a lineup of 100 musicians, maybe there'd be eight, eight women like in bands, <laughs> either like as lead singers, like as the main act, or not even just lead singers, but majority women in a band. It was such, there's such a huge difference. I think that disparity is still there, but I feel like I'm seeing it close in a little bit more, and I'm seeing a lot more inclusion for non-binary folks as well, and you're, it's a long struggle, and I feel like it's going to be a while before we see, like, true representation, but to me, at least, it feels like there is a shift, and I think it's because there has been so much pressure, because you see write-ups now that blatantly show you uh, those kind of images so that you can see side by side. And so that, on one hand, to me feels positive. On the other, another thing is the music industry itself seems completely different. Like we, record labels no longer have the kind of power that they used to. They're not as necessary if you can make it on your own by uploading your own music online yeah. and then finding, like, it just feels like there are new paths forward, and I'm hopeful that we'll see more representation in, in music. But I know that the challenges are still there because 
you have to build community, you have to create that network, and you have to have support from each other. It's very hard to go into something entirely independently without knowing anyone in the scene. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> anyone else wanna? Yeah. All right. Allison, as a musician, since you're <laughs> still playing shows. <laughs> so, well, not right now, but. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't feel like I always have my finger on the pulse because I, I don't go out as much as I used to and I, but I have remained active in bands up until real recently. But, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that really gives me hope and um, bands that are just super cool and politicized and stuff. Uh, this band, Downtown Boys, who I love, this band, Horror, um, I don't know, a million that I'm not thinking, Priest, whoever. Um, and, uh, oh wait, Fuck You Pay Us. Yes. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I don't know, I just went to this event last night that was like the, all these old school punk people, mostly dudes, and I mean, actually, the, they were showing for a new series on punk, and the footage was actually pretty cool and more diverse than I thought it was going to be, and the event also didn't feel as broed out as I thought it was going to be, <laughs> but then this morning, I had breakfast with a woman, with a woman, a producer on it. And she kind of just told us, I fought for every single bit of that. Like, mm -hmm. the very few women who are in it, you know, or whatever, she's like, I had to fight really hard for that. So it's the behind the scenes stuff that you're like, oh, industry type stuff never changes. Mm -hmm. Now I guess a big deal, or part of that is film industry or TV industry, but still. I, I know living in, in East West Hurley. Um, <laughs> I really, it's really Woodstock. It's, it's really Woodstock. And, and um, where I live in, in Woodstock and in, in Kingston, New York State, you know, there was a huge exodus up there. So New York City doesn't really exist for many of us anymore. But um, I know a lot of people who book in a couple of amazing, amazing venues up there. And they get a lot of great new bands and a lot of older bands. And they're still chafing and fighting to get as many, you know, as many women in them men. I mean, just to, to be that A to B about it, or as many sort of, not even, you know, non-binary as opposed to just like the sort of very specific hetero-identified thing. And it really, it depends on who's booking. And again, so it's all about who are you going to give the airtime to? Who are you going to give that voice to? But they can't get away with doing weeks and weeks and weeks of the same thing anymore. And that's because the youngest audiences who are going there refuse to participate in that. And that, I'm, I love that. I mean, I really love that. I was teaching journalism at SUNY New Paltz, and I just happened to have this class of really sophisticated students. and. Um, they were all talking about no longer going to this one club because this one club wouldn't book women bands, period. They wouldn't book any you know, queer bands and they wouldn't book any women bands. And they were like, okay, fine, we'll go somewhere else. And the club had to change. Mm -hmm. That's pressure from the inside, that's nice. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna um, let you guys ask questions. Anyone have a question? Uh, uh, so many people, okay, Carol. <laughs> My question is about the editing process that was mentioned here. It, how, how was the editing process? Um, it was actually, it was great, um, but it was a lot of work. Um, and I, I have edited before, uh, edited books before, so I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. Um, but I, I, I really like to collaborate. Like that's sort of, I, I realize, something that I like to do, so I guess that's why I've done so many um, and books that are anthologies in one way or another. Um, so actually, this I loved working on this book, and um, everybody, it, it, everybody was great to work with, the publisher was great to work with, and I got to bring in so many people that I've known over the years in different capacities, as well as writers that I had never worked with before and just followed online or, or whatever, followed their work. 
Um, so I got to meet a lot of people. And then we've also become this like little community of <laughs> writers, which has been really incredible. So when I've been, you know, I actually went on a book tour, which was itself amazing. Um, and in each stop, whatever local contributors <coughs> were there, we'd, I'd have them join me for the event. Um, so we had some amazing events in New York with this organization, Persisticon, um, that we raised like $20,000 for Emily's List that night. Um, and then here in LA, we've been doing stuff. We've been doing radio shows and stuff, and we've formed a group called Turn It Up, um, which you'll be hearing more about mm -hmm. of, of women, um, so that women don't necessarily have to uh, maybe go through what they've gone through in the past, or they don't have to go through it alone to surprise, provide a network of support. So um, yeah, so it's been really fun at every at every level. You had a question back there? Um, yeah, my question was just kind of a little bit more on like the broadcasting industry. You talked a lot about how like radio is a chance to give females a voice, um, and a lot of radio broadcasters are saying things which sound crazy, kind of like, <laughs> women don't want to hear women, and there aren't enough women out there, which is absolutely absurd to me. Um, but like, how would you guys as artists and as broadcasters, I know you guys play uh, women on your station, I'm sure, I'm going to let Allison move to, as our DJ podcast <laughs> people, um, <laughs> to handle that one, or, or Sean. Um, yeah, that's a great question and something that we're actually trying to address right now. Mm -hmm. So as Evelyn mentioned, we started a group called Turn It Up. Um, it was born out of the book. A bunch of us were together. Um, we did an interview with KPFK, and there were maybe eight to ten of us just hanging out like eating fruit and drinking coffee mm -hmm. and we were talking about a lot of the things that we're talking about tonight how things are changing but they're only changing because people put pressure um, they only change when you organize and when you speak up and so we started to think through some of the challenges that currently exist and one of the major ones was um, exactly that like lack of representation on the radio like female DJs and also the diversity of uh, artists that are played on the radio, um, both on a mainstream and also often on an independent level. And so one of our actions is to um, work with local radio stations to um, address some of the, uh, <laughs> just having more diversity on air because I, my background is in public radio and now podcasts. And one of the things that listeners would always write in about was the sound of women's voices. Um, and I was lucky enough to get my start at Marketplace where we completely disregarded all of those <laughs> and specifically made an intention to put reporters with a variety of voices on the air. Women who did have vocal fry can also talk about the economy <laughs> and you should still pay attention and listen to them. And it was, all of those complaints were coming from a few men <laughs> who were vocal about it. So it's really not a big deal. Um, like it's not, it, that's not something most listeners care about. <laughs> and the only way to change it is by exposing more women's voices. And uh, on a local level, at least, like I have a show here on KXLU, but in our group, we have DJs on KSPC, on DubLab, <coughs> on NTS, on um, KCS. K, KPCC, like every station pretty much. And we have right Yeah, KPFK. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every independent non commercial radio station in Los Angeles um, and LA area. And we realized that some of the most successful shows are helmed by women and that any of the concerns that a lot of other stations might have about women DJs are not based in any truth, it's mm -hmm. just based on assumption that, that women's shows don't perform as well or that people don't want to listen to female musicians. So we're hoping to present some of our collective research from all of the stations that we have as part of this group to put, just encourage them and to do it as, hey, you have an opportunity to, to correct this. Like it's not, like maybe just acknowledge this, but internally just correct it and it's a cool opportunity to set the stage for other radio stations. Um, but I think it's really important and that's something we're trying to change.
Yeah, I mean, that's, that uh, is one of the ways in which women have been excluded. Um, as women artists, it's, it's very notorious for radio stations to say, oh, only you know, one woman per hour, it's particularly like classic rock radio or alternative rock, supposedly alternative does that also. Um, so unfortunately, we're um, running out of time for uh, this, but we have plenty of time left um, to hang out and sign some books and talk to you <laughs> and listen to some music from um, Floor and McAllister, we'll KXLU DJs. Um, also, uh, one other contributor is here, I think, Lucretia Tide Jasmine. Are you still here? I'm here. Here she is, <laughs> yay. She wrote nine entries for the book. Um, so hopefully she'll also join us for signing books so you can have six people um, sign your very own copy, which is on sale uh, here at a discounted price, I noticed, too. So um, <laughs> thank you all for coming, and um, it's just Thank you.